So uh, welcome to uh, another uh, FES Center Neuroprosthesis Seminar. So we've been uh, this year trying to do these jointly with other neuro-related groups uh, around the city. And the next two we have are with the uh, Center for Neurological Restoration at Cleveland Clinic. And Andre Machado and I have been trying to uh, organize these. So um, uh, before we introduce today's speaker, next month, uh, Dr. Michael Stanton-Hicks will be our speaker January 11th. I hope you have that on your calendar. <laughs> so for once, we have a local speaker. Uh, uh, I think that's uh, probably the first time in a couple years. Um, so uh, this morning, we have uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar, uh, who is uh, coming to us from uh, Regina, Saskatchewan. He's a neurosurgeon um, in the um, at the Regina uh, General Hospital. And I'd much rather hear him speak than go through these 50 pages of all of his accomplishments, but I want to highlight a couple things um, that he's done. Obviously, he's uh, been doing a lot of uh, clinical work and research in spinal cord stimulation as well as, as other things, but I think the main topic today is spinal cord stimulation. Um, but he uh, received the, when the Queen, uh, celebrated our 50 years uh, reigning, he received the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal. That was in 2002. And as you probably know, the Queen just celebrated, those of you who follow uh, anything in the, in the British Empire, just celebrated 60 years. And so uh, just this year, uh, received the uh, Diamond Jubilee uh, Queen's Award. So I don't know how many people received both. I'll bet that was a pretty small, uh, small company. I had a couple slides, but I don't really have time to arrange them, but um, I wanted to show you uh, that he has a street uh, named after him in Regina, uh, Kumar Lane. You can Google it and find it. <laughs> um, although it's a pretty short street, I noted. Um, uh, and also, also, <laughs> yeah. When you get a highway, then I guess you're you're really there. But um, the. Uh, uh, he also has a, a biography out, uh, not, not a biography, but a biography uh, of his life. Um, and that is available on Amazon if you want to uh, look that up as well. So uh, we want to welcome Dr. Kumar uh, today and thank him for coming down south uh, to, uh, to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure and honor. And I'm thankful to the organization to have me here. I don't know what I can tell you with this learned group. I was instructed to talk about something, what's the status of the neurostimulation it is today. Because I was a principal investigator for process study, which did a randomized controlled trial for spinal cord stimulation. They told me, what are the problems that you face? Where do I see the subject going? What is my wish list? And you are such a bright ingenious here. I have my wish list to tell you what I would like you to do, focus your research, improve the efficacy. We could cut down the cost, which is the biggest problem, and we can happily live together. So here we start. So how does it go here? Will it go on this one? OK, so here is my, uh, my disclosures. I do act as a consultant and have received grants from both Boston and Medtronic in the past. So what I thought, I will divide my talk into three parts. First, I will show what is the present status of the spinal cord stimulation. We'll talk about the three art cities which has already been done. What our cities are on the horizon. What are their shortcomings? What are the problems in enrollment and how we measure the outcomes? The problems of technical factors, the effect on wait time, which I want is closer to my heart and I'm trying to drag the people here to come and join me. A word about cost effectiveness and then we talk about the future. What's the problem with the high frequency stimulation? Tripolar stimulation, which is now getting more and more excited. And how do I treat my aching back? I've tried to divide the back into two parts, the low back and the high back. Low back means from the gluteal fold 
to the iliac crest level, and from iliac crest level to the lower rib cage, that's called high back. We have some success in treating the low back, but not good enough for the high back. That remains still my aching back. And what are the new therapeutic indications? So that's my outline, but I'm going to talk. So there are three RCTs, as you know, so far. And the first one, that's the one I was associated with, which brought me here, is called the PROCESS study, which was a prospective randomized control, multicentral study to evaluate the effectiveness and cost effectiveness spinal cord stimulation using in synergy that is a non rechargeable battery system in reducing pain of the patients, both of the leg and the back. So this was the, the notion or the aim of this study. You must understand this was the first time any class one type of a, a, a result has come out because up till now we had a lot of case reports and expert reports, but, but there's no class one evidence. This was all not considered even a full class one. This got degraded to class 1B. One of the biggest problems with these studies is the cost of doing it. And, and therefore, we need the sponsorship of the industry. This costed over a million dollars. And I don't think any university can afford it these days to run those big trials. So this is a big the drawback here. The second one, which is was headed by Dr. Daunt, it is about the spinal cord stimulation versus repeated lumbosacral spinal surgery for chronic pain. And I will tell you what, how, what kind of results he got. And the third, which you're already aware of, is the spinal cord stimulation in patients with reflex sympathy dystrophy. And that's a landmark study. And these are the only three studies so, which have been published so far. The question was asked, why did he do it? We have a large patient population, and as you know, we have to 3% of the population suffers with a neuropathic pain. Their quality of life is very poor. When I say what, what do you mean by poor, that means they're as bad as patients suffering with cancer or, or, or heart failure. That means if you, if you chart the quality of life on EQ5D, usually you're supposed to have one as the best, best healthy paper. We don't, but in national average, the says for the Americans is about 0.6. So you have to get there. But this one is around 0 0.1, 0 0.5 or so, this kind of patient, I will show you the chart. And so what we're finding is that the drugs don't seem to help these people somehow, and so they have to find some other way of doing it. So what we do, we enroll 12 centers in Europe, Australia, and Canada, and we had 100 patients, uh, which was, uh, randomized one to one in the two arms, one with the conventional medical treatment, another which has received the spinal cord stimulation as well. What are the questions were asked, which, which we are trying to, in the new study which is coming up now, is what is a conventional medical treatment? So in the formal thing, it was say anything the physician wanted to do, except no intrathecal drug therapy and no reoperation. And this becomes the biggest problem. Another thing which we didn't try at that time is try to voluntarily reduce, see if we can cut the drug down. We let them, people, physici physicians or the primary investigator, give the drugs as they want, and they never paid any attention. So the amount of drug reduction was kind of small in this case, and this is one of the biggest uh, problem or one of the biggest objections with the study had. So here was the trial. So you have a baseline, you randomization, one to one. You went on to the spinal cord stimulation, then you had a trial stimulation. If successful, you get implanted. Otherwise, in the other group, where you, you are left with the conventional medical treatment, and then they were followed for 24 months. At six month period, patients are allowed to jump the boat. If you're not happy with where you are, you can, you can go to the other group. This, of course, as all the researchers know, muddles up the waters because you don't have the pure group then. But the real problem comes up. It's very difficult to hold the people in their own, own group for such a long time. So real world problem comes in. They don't want to stay. And another problem is that the people, by the time they come to a pain physician or to a spinal cord implanter, and you tell them you try some more physio physiotherapy or some more uh, treatment, conventional treatment, they say, I had all of this for a couple of years. At the moment, patients, I will show you the data, 
that in the worldwide literature, the patients wait for a four and a half years to get an implant. So there's a lot of time is already wasted. They don't want to waste anymore. They come with a predetermined mind. And this produces another problem in enrollment. So this is how the patient, the patient range. See, this gives a typical example. We had 50 people, 44 continued. At the end of six months, we lost three, so they left 41. Then out of it, after six months, when the Carroll door was open, 30 people crossed over to the spinal cord implant. So there were big exodus. 28 crossed in the first 12 months and two after that. So see, they were left with a, out of 50, we left with only 11 patients left in the continued group with conventional medical treatment. Well, on the other side, we started with 54 lost, 46, so 42 continued. Out of this, you know, two, two had lost to follow up and two, uh, two failed. So this is how the 42 left out of 46. But you can see this group is four times bigger than this group. So the, the proportion becomes odd, but that's the real world situation. So what were we looking for? We were looking in these cases is reduction in the pain in both in the back and the leg. And then the secondary objective is relief of pain, back and leg, quality of life as measured by SF36 or EQ5 duty, their ability to work, their satisfaction, drug intake, and, and time to return to work. That's another biggest question which I'd like to say, that the spinal cord stimulation, unfortunately, does not send the patient back to work. People who are already working, they continue to work. But new patients, to send them back is rather difficult. Also, you, it, it gets degraded to a palliative procedure rather than a curative procedure, especially if you see the controversy which we're having in the Washington state where the, where just the compensation patients are not entitled to carry on with the spinal cord stimulation program, and they are not entitled to it. So that becomes a big, big problem. Now, if you look at how, how, how do you find it, these are the results charted out. This is with the intention to treat. So right away, you start to get a benefit of this thing. One month, three months, and this, uh, this is the peak. Then there's, as, the, as the people start to do more and more activity, there's some regression, further regression. But what you're seeing, this, the number of conventional medical treatment is very small. There's hardly one patient or 7% here, and about 38 or so in the, in the spinal cord stimulation. So that's true that we won the race. But we are not, the two biggest factors have been that not able to send them to work. And, and now the other way of skinning the cat is this is by the intention, revised intention treat means if you jump the gun from one group to another, you're considered a failure. In that also you can see there was only one patient who succeeded. And here was a 17 patient. In the PER treatment means if you take the patient who joined, jumped from conventional medical treatment to the spinal cord group, you have a higher success rate. But proportionately, it didn't do any good. So we, no matter how we dissect the results, the spinal cord stimulation program does benefit, both in terms of pain and quality of life and ability to work, but not good enough to return to work. This is the biggest problem with the compensation people are trying that you spend so much money, but we, have, we still have to pay out for their, for their disability and for sitting at home. So we have to find some other way of doing it, some other way. This was the uh, secondary outcome, as you can see, and this is the ODI, or the, and this is a functional outcome. You can see that's 60 score, which improved to around 45. So this statistically, this improvement in the function is better. Same thing happened in EQ5. This is what I meant to say, that the quality of life in this patient very bad, 1.5, as compared to about six or seven. And they improved to around four and a half, five, the peak, and then there were de degradation. One of the biggest problems in reporting all these results is that all these measures are subjective. They have no objective way of, uh, of establishing the, what the patient says, this is patient's perception. It doesn't matter what we do. So we have to devise some other objective way of, 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 of reporting these results. 
Then another biggest question is the, the high amount of complication right here. You can see the biggest complications are in the lead, in the, related to hardware. So leads have improved, but still not good enough. We still have practice, we still have displacement. So I will try to say that the engineers have to find a better lead. The engineers have to find a lead which will not break. And we'll go into a little bit details as to what can we do with each lead. What this is the Kaplan bar curve, and the, this says that most of the surgery needed to repair the job is in the very first year. And after that, it's not, it's not zero, but it becomes quite stable. <clears throat> so what we have to impress on the first year is the critical in these cases. Here is this thing. We were able to set only five people to work. And that's a dismal record. This is trying to see the opioid intake. What we're trying to show here, that opioid intake in the, in the spinal cord group remain stable, but there's a projected to get the opioid intake higher in the, in, the, in the control group or in the conventional medical treatment. But the efforts were not directed towards reducing this, and this is in the new, I'll show you the new study which is coming up. Now, just taking to what, what happens to the, to reoperation, and here Dr. North showed that if you, instead of doing a disc recurrence, if you have, if you put an implant in, you can still have a 47% success rate as compared to 12 with the reoperation. So reoperation is a, is a very poor result, and I will show you the economics as to that, how much it costs money. This is about the CRPS, and as you well know, they have, he has got three groups. One is the PT, physiotherapy plus spinal cord stimulation, physiotherapy alone, and, this, and the people who had a purely had an implant done. So this first three years, it was good. It was come down, but then fourth and fifth year, due to various reasons, the results are not statistically significant or the, pay, or the, or the, pay, or the benefit fell down, possibly due to disease progression. There's some flaws in the study also as to the, they you know, included some patients which were failed into the, into the into trial and then got the stimulation. So that muddied it up. But on the whole, there is some regression of this. One of the biggest problems with the spinal cord stimulation is the results of regress. So we have to find ways and means as to why so why they regress? There is some physiological problem. We are not stimulating right thing, or some neural plasticity takes place, and this is what we have to look into it. So, where, where, what happened to other RCTs? So, evidence study. This was this was supported by Boston Scientific, and this was the same thing as the more, on largest case as that North study was. It's about the spinal cord stimulation versus reoperation, and after two hours of struggle, only 28 patients were were recruited. The the target was 130, so the company gave it up. They spent quite a bit of money, at least a couple of hundred thousand dollars in recruitment, but then they withdrew the study this year, so that fell apart. So that tells you the problem of recruitment in these cases and how the people's mind has changed. So. In the, in the next part of my talk, I'll go into that. Then we have the NEVROS, the, the high frequency study, which has now been started in the United States. It's already been approved in Australia and in Europe. There were some papers in the NANCE this year on this. But the NEVRO people are still keeping things to their heart. They're not telling the, what exactly is the physiology here. They just, because they, they say, well, this, before the FDA, we can't tell you. And that's the biggest trouble. There's some changes in the spinal cord waveform which they do. They used to, say, put the electrode any place you want, you know, just like this, shove it in, and connect it to that high frequency of 10 hertz, 10 kilohertz, and the pain will be gone. But that's not correct. You have to put this on a sweet spot. The, the electrode must be between D8 and D10. So that now came out because the European studies, which there's some few published papers which they allowed to 
be published or allowed to be presented. So there is something called a sweet spot even in Nebula study. And, the, and what pulses are there, they're not telling you. So this is a new study called, by, again now, by, reported by Medtronic, which will be starting now this year, possibly, uh, oh, by January or February. This talks about the effectiveness of 565, that is surgical lead, which is 16 contact points. It has to be introduced by a small laminotomy. And then you have to see how much benefit the patients which are to be recruited have a higher degree of pain in their back as compared to the legs. And the object of the study is to see how much back pain relief is there, high back and lower back. As I was telling you, the back is divided arbitrarily between the two, from the iliac and the gluteal force to the iliac crest, that's the low, and from the iliac crest to the lower rib cage, that's the high back. I've done some work on this. We have 70 cases now. This was before this study, before we putting our head into it. I myself have been able to get only 10% relief better in the high back. We're going to get about 35, 40% in the low back. So I still haven't found what is the way of doing it. There is something which you're missing. My aching back still remains aching. So that's what is the next question which has to be put to the engineers. Where should we stimulate? How should we stimulate? and what kind of programming is to be there. I'll, I'll go into that in the next phase. And then somebody asked me, what about the non-surgical treatment of failed back surgery syndrome? And I don't have, oh, the follow-up here is very, very poor, and the studies are designed, so I thought to skip it. So now is the shortcomings. So this is where we start to see why these studies fail. So but there's a misperception that surgery is, better, is a better cure than putting pain, uh, and, and, and it answers the, the attacks the pain generator itself. This is why the, the study by Boston failed, because the patient knew that they have a recurrence of the disc. Now the question was, do I get a spinal cord stimulator on it, or I go to a surgeon and get my disc out? The protocol called for a second opinion. And as soon as you send the patient to a second opinion from an implanter or an anesthesia consult to the surgeon, the patient never came back. He was told, well, to, you have uh, two things. You have, you, don't you see you have trouble in that, your back? Don't you want to get it out? You can always have your implant afterwards. So naturally, the patient died. So if they, if, even if they don't agree, they went to the next one. They somehow get persuaded that there is a better chance to relieve the pathology. And so surgery is superior already to a spinal cord implant. There, so we, this, that's how the, this misperception and, the, and what the surgeons think, especially the orthopedic surgeon, if they go down, they're willing to operate. It doesn't matter what it is and how many times it is. As you know, when you have the spinal cord, when you have got a surgery one after another, the return of benefit is less and less in proportionally going down by the square root, not simple division. So we have to get over this, this feeling. And also in all the protocol, this multiple opinions, I was so dead against, I said, you just, you can operate on a person's heart without asking anybody, your, your colleague, what do you know? Why do you need for this simple thing to go to another surgeon to say, it will, it will never work. And so after one and a half years, they, they tried to solve the problem by taking away the, uh, the second opinion, but still the damage had been done. The another thing which is, which is now coming up is the lack of a benefit of SCC persist. But it is considered the last resort. Now I understand the federal government was also trying to say that you're spending too much money. And we have to see why we are spending too much money. Why they're feeling that the insurance companies and the Medicare thing, that it should be labeled as the last resort, not as the first resort. Because we, because we are not taking it rightly. We have poor results of 30% or more of failure in the trials. In, in, I'm not talking about Cleveland Clinic. Cleveland Clinic only has 15, 16% failure rate. But, but in, the, in the town here, where the, where the people, on an average at the moment, if you look at the whole country as a whole of the United States, per pain physician, only four implants per year. 
If you do a four implant per year, you get nothing. If you get paid by the number of contacts, you get eight electrode, eight, and you get. If you do it in the in your in house in your office, you get the CM machine, you get five hundred dollars per contact. So if you put one one ray of uh, electrode of eight, you get four thousand. Plus you put one more, and you can convince one more to support the third. You put a triple. So you know. This, they were driven by the money, and that has to come out we, on, on that side. So the experimental, that it should not be considered experimental, it should be considered curative. And we have to improve the success rate. That's what it is. Then I was saying that in an RCT, the data which is mostly subjective, it is the patient who tells what is by what is the pain relief by looking at the visual analog scale. So he puts a mark there, or even in even a verbal thing, as what percentage of pain is better. That is subjective. We don't have a, a some kind of a equipment which we can tie to his hand or leg or something, which will not only monitor how much he sleeps, how much he walks, how much he steps up and down he goes, and how much activity he does. And then you should be able to read it over. The, even the present uh, log, which is there in the sensor, it, li li it is only three months, and the, the data wipes out. So that's no good. You have to have a long-term data. And it's hard. It's not easy to take it out. So if you have to have a, a data, uh, you are a, the objective measurement of the, of the health state of the person, not just ask him how, how good you are. The, all, all studies say, you find our patient's willingness to have the reoperation or redesign the thing. While he is a captive audience, whatever he says is just a mouthpiece. So he, there must be some objective evidence of it. And that at present, we are against fighting against the pharmaceutical companies. When pharmaceutical companies put out a new pain, pain uh, drug, they only test it for six weeks. Now the instrument companies, even they say they want to take it for six years, six months usually, they went with a lot of stress up to two years. But that's two years is not a good enough data because we need a much more longer term data. We must know what happens to them up to 10 years. As to how much the, the, there is a regression of the benefit effect. So is there a way of projecting it? If you can't do it by the real time, there should be some way of projecting this thing. Uh, Enter biophysiologically. So maybe the engineers could find that way. Then the biggest question comes up we, when we take a, a RCT, we produce a two demographics, means we have, it could be kept by two arms, which is age, sex, and the number of operations done, and some of the data which we try to balance. But is these two groups' arms balanced? The, is this the only thing that makes a difference between the same treatment applied to the two groups? The answer is not there. The human being is a much more complex machinery. And there is something called genos or genetics in it. So if you, they, because they are, both groups are genetically heterogeneous. So the treatment you have, are one of the same to the two groups, is the result is different. So you're not comparing apple to apple. So there has to be found some other, some other genetically observation has to be modeled into the selection of these people so that the results are, are exactly the same. The effect of the treatment is the same, which is not at the moment. So this is for the future. And as I showed, presently, we are only aiming, we are able to do the radicular aspect of the pain. The ache, back ache still remains, so the actual pain is still not harnessed. And we need equipment to harness this thing. And whatever we have got, so what we have to find another sweet spot, or, the, or, or you have to come up with an idea as that you need so many contact points. And it should it be spread out, should it be compact, because the two companies are talking too differently. One company has the idea that the, the, the contact points or electrodes must be compacted together so you can deliver more, more energy and more localized energy. Others feel you can spread it all over town. So that's another thing with the, maybe the researchers and the engineers could work on the animal model or something to tell us. At present, biggest problem which we have is the MRI compatibility. The 
Medtronic is just going to release the first its uh, first uh, um, lead, which will be compatible with head and receive coil. As long as the the electrode or the lead is not in the coil or below the coil, then you can do it. But what about thousands of machines which are whole body? We can't do them. That's another year or so more away. So this 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 is the problem with the with the lead, which is the biggest trouble. But this is trying to form. But the only one company is trying to do it. The other two have not spent any money on R and D. The another problem which you have, but half of our women, half of the population of the world is female. Half of them are childbearing. And what is the status of those leads with the childbearing or in pregnancy? There are only eight reported cases of pregnancy which have been carried out with the with the spinal cord stimulation in place, but they will all be in stock once the patient is aware of being pregnancy. But whatever three, four months, which is the most period of tetrogen or, or the abnormality when the fetus can get, none of them have showed any after birth, any fetal abnormality. That's a good point of it. So are we happen, we don't have enough research on this. So we, we need to have more research on this and engineers to find out what is the tetrogenous effect on the unborn baby. And, and that's because we are uh, streaming of half the people. We don't know what to do with these people. <coughs> and the, with this next is the number of contacts per lead. We have a race going on. When I first started 35 years ago, we had one contact, one single electrode in the tip of the lead. Then came the four. Then came the eight. Then came the 16 uh, last year with the Boston. And last week, they just released 32. So 32 leads we have got sticking on that. It's a lot of leads. I said, well, is there any, any, is there any way of telling it that only eight is better or 32 is better or 64 is better? Same thing is happening to surgical leads. We started with four, the resume, the metronic. Then became six, then became eight, then became 16, and then the 20. And the new lead is coming out, which will be 32. So uh, where do we end? Do we need all this lift? Because every time you need the number of contact, you increase the circuitry, you, you have to do more work. You earn more money. From uh, three, four, five hundred dollars, we're now spending twenty-five hundred dollars a lead. Uh, and the price is rising. And are we getting the bang of it? That's the good question. So what the engineers really need to show, unbiasedly, not for the profit of the company, do we need that? And if you do need it, where do I put it? That's the next question. And what does that do by having so much? Can we start them all up and down? Positive, negative, positive, negative, or something, or what kind of combination? So this, this is the, the only thing I, I could see by increasing the number of leads is the, lead, is the dropping in the number of re surgical revisions when the lead displays axially up and down. But we haven't found a way to change the lead from side to side. If a patient is a torsion scoliosis, there are very high incidence of the lead moving side to side. What we want from the engineers is some kind of a, a tentacle that will come out like umbrella, like the, you put the uh, transvenous filter for the preventing DVT. It opens up like an umbrella. It sticks there. You can collapse and pull it out. So this is a good question. This, we cannot put a glue on its head, but something has to be done that, uh, that they don't move because we still got a 5-7% chance of it. it's moving. We have got all kinds of. Then the, this is a slightly old hat of mine, uh, which we did that with the two papers came out, my smile and, uh, and Dr. Henderson's paper, six months apart, independently worked. And you can see what happens when the, uh, when the battery is in the buttocks or in the belly area. So the, what is the excursion here? In, when, the, uh, when the battery is in the belly, there's only 0.2 centimeter of excursion during walking and 1.7 during twisting. This becomes a nine centimeters when the, uh, when the IGP or the battery is in the buttocks. So you, that tells you, reminding you that you have to leave redundant loops in, in the system. So, and this is one way to preventing it, a lead displacement because of pull. 
these are various fixation devices which are now available in market. One was, more was released last week by Medtronic, which expands like a glove and then shrinks on the, like elasticity and then squeezes the, the it from, uh, from moving the lead. So that's interesting. So lead migration, up and down has been solved, but side to side has not been solved. Uh, and another problem is the discomfort over the battery side. <coughs> this is this reported. This is underreported round six because I myself did it, and I I think I ignored the people saying but it's not six; it is sixteen percent. And so, what what was the answer to that? You reduce the size of the battery, you take the corners out, but it doesn't help. There is something more coating is required on the surface of the battery can to make it less irritable to the skin. And, and therefore, they keep on moving. These patients are, are not very thankful to you for taking their pain away. They, they, you get cured one pain, you give me another one. And I, what I find is that even if you harm the people, even if you change from one place to the next, they, they get pain in the other place. Why? That means there's something in that metal or something. So we need to devise a polymer or something which will not cause this pain. Is it due to the, because I'm not surely convinced that it is due to some kind of neuroma, the surgeon produced by cutting it the wrong way. Because what, why does it happen in the second place, third place, and you keep on going forever? So that's, that's one question which is got here. This is what I just finished telling you, the number of contact. And the new leads continue to climb. This is a race. There seems to be no end point. So we have to show the efficacy of this and stop this, because this, this race, unfortunately, costs more and more money. But we haven't sh shown that long-term success rate has improved, except one thing, that the rate of revision due to longitudinal slippage has decreased. This is the one, that, you know, all those kinds of leads which you can see, this is the 16 one to pump buster. And this is a Penta, which has got 20 contact point, but this is obsolete, 32 is coming out. Now, this is another thing to my heart. Long-term success rate is less than 50, or just I showed you 48%. Yeah, is this good enough? It's not good enough. You need something better. And why uh, I was looking as to, as to, as to what, what can we do to do it? Can we, one, can we improve the leads? The leads have become so many contacts. You can have it widely spaced, compact, and all kinds. It doesn't seem to work. Can you achieve the battery with a different kind of pulse? Have a, have a uh, battery delivery on a constant voltage, constant current? It has not made any difference. Maybe the first, maybe the engineers can tell us, is there much difference between the, between what happens physiologically between the constant current and constant voltage, you know, because the endpoints seem to be the same. In the DBS, now everybody has gone to constant current, but still nobody has given up the fight. So what we have found out that with the delay, the success is inversely proportional to time interval, which passes from the onset of pain to the time of your delivery of the spinal cord implant. So this intersection, which I will show you, has to move towards the left. I'll just show the next diagram, which you'll see. And what we find out, that if you do it within the first year or so, you can get about 80% success rate. But if you delay 15 years plus, your success rate drops down to 10 to 15%. So there's a big difference. Something physiologically is taking place. Something is happening to the circuitry in the brain. Something is taking place to the, to the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cluster for each year of pain, uh, constant pain, uh, degrades or, or melts away 1.3 cubic centimeter of gray matter. That means you're aging 10 years per year instead of one year. So you're on a real highway drive. So even if you don't do this procedure to relieve the pain, you let the patient suffer, you'll get Alzheimer's much faster. So you have to pay for their nursing home much faster. Because all these people, uh, you know, they, they're poor. 
they have already sold off. They're not working. So here is the graph, which is a true graph. This is on 600 patients uh, being uh, tabulated. That's in the first year of first is, is up to 80, and then it progressively goes down every five years. We have 25, 30. It comes down to all the way down. It destabilizes around 5 percent. So that's no good. So if you look at different way, or oh, here, if you plot the success, the success and the failure, they intersect here. And what this intersection, to my utter surprise, if you drop it down, it's around four and a half or five years. So today, all the multiple study, multiple center studies will show you that the delay from the uh, from the onset of the pain to the time you uh, implanted is four and a half years gone. What has happened during this time? So my theory is that the only way to make the success better is to move this intersection here somewhere. And how do I move it? Is that by awareness of the people. Where, what happens to these people? What I found it, first three months I lost in the patient applying the Glenmother's medicine or, or, or refusal to understand that. Thing will go away, take aspirin, something, do something. Then they go to the family physician and they sit there for a year and a half. One drug, one physiotherapy, one massage, thump on your back, needle in your foot, reflexology, anesthesiology, call it anything. Then he's, when he gets fed up or he's tired of listening, he sends it to somebody. If he sends it to an orthopod, he gets an operation. They lose three, four years there. If he goes to an anesthesiologist who doesn't do the trait, they get one needle after another, one different kind of drug, and then you lose another three years there. Then they form, then they send it to somebody. The good people are the neurologists, you know, they, they send them out quickly. The worst is the orthopedic surgeons and the, and the anesthesiologists or the pain medicine people who do not implant. And the, the history, as I was telling you, is four per year. So they, they, they want to hang on the good, sweet medicine, to, which gives the most money towards the end. So the, I, I'm urging that this, I'm trying to tell the colleagues here if they can give me some ammunition, because I have the Canadian figures, but I just wanted to have some American figures to go with it. OK. OK, what is the cause of the fracturing? As you know, the stress places here where the kink angle. Kink angle is what they, when it comes out and it goes down, this acute angle is possible fatigue. And this is another thing which the, the, where the electrode breaks or the lead breaks. So this is, needs some kind of enforcement. The simple solution which I suggest is to shove the anchor through the defacia so this angle becomes more, more uh, not acute, it becomes higher degree. I call it kink angle. And that reduces the, um, that reduces the rate of fracturing. Maybe the engineers can do something where you can have some other sheet which can anchor or slide on the top and go inside and fix there, and then reinforce it and doesn't break. Here, we have a question about the batteries. A patient, a pain patient is a patient for life. It's for all life, the pain doesn't go away. It's like a dermatology. They never dies and never gets cured. So this plus 40 years of lifespan. And what we are giving them, before we had a single non-recharge, they lasted about three years. Although the Metroni said it will last up to five, it never did. Then what they did a trick, played a trick, they become a rechargeable battery, in which they put a clock. So at nine, it's seven, it just shuts itself off. You did a bench testing with the other equipment, Boston, Boston, no, Boston Scientific did a study, it will last for 20. Sure enough, it does. St. Jude's got an approval for 10. Now the Medtronics are thinking of taking the, shutting that battery, you know, that timer off in it. They say, formerly the, the way they wanted to kind of shyless me up, there's a chemical that takes place and it's like the cell battery of your telephone, it, has, it goes haywire, it doesn't charge. That's true, the charging capacity decreases. But it never becomes zero. You let it fade by itself. Why do you want to impose? Because the reason was that 30% of the Medtronic's money was coming from changing the battery every three years. And now they suddenly lost that money. 
So I'm hoping that the battery will become better. It will become so. But we have to look something outside the present battery system to power these things. And what can we do? Possibly, we'll have to look at alternate source, like a, one of the sources suggested by Dark Army or Bayan, or, or to reduce the life is the resistance should be reduced. So, because the battery is lying 50, 60 centimeters away from the point of contact. So there's so many ohms here. So if you reduce the number of ohms, which is resistant, the battery will last longer. So diathermy is there are some other kind of power systems needed. Power system has to be put in the head of the contact point, not too far away. And of course, every time you change the battery, there's a morbidity and mortality and cost to it. Another thing with the dead, they miniaturize it. They miniaturize the battery. The funny thing happened, when you miniaturize the, the battery or the can, you reduce the capacitor. And what it does, it, it requires more number of charging. It requires more charging. The better the battery, the more the capacitor, more the battery storage. But in order to make it fanciful and more acceptable, we rounded them off. <coughs> and made the can is smaller. So, you, so what you're going to, you have to charge it more often. And sometimes, this is another thing, is that you can produce a heat burn on this. This problem has not been solved, but it was the problem in the early stages of heat production at the, car, at the interface. The one which is most, which is bugging me the most, is in rechargeable batteries, that there has to be two centimeters from the surface of the contact with the recharger that is from the skin to the, to the depth. In a fat person, two centimeters is nothing. So that's stuck. Now you say, well, put it two, two centimeters from it, put it in the fat. There's nowhere to anchor it, you know? So what happens is when you put it in the fat, there's no anchor, so it tips like this. When it tips, it doesn't recharge. You get the same headache again. So there has to be, for the engineers, the thing, you have to be able to charge it from much more distance, not two centimeters, which is the present limit. And not if it tips it out like 25, 30, 40 degrees, then you can charge it. There's still some way, some way where your scanner link should not be like a contact, but should be like an antenna, a circular antenna. And then it charges. It doesn't matter whether it tips this way or tips that way. It should be able to charge. So that's my wish, and i like to ask your help in finding a way of doing this so that the recharge of batteries could be kept much, much more safely, especially in the, in the fat. And America is getting fat. So we better work on it. <laughs> Tilt of me. It becomes impossible. They're very, very unhappy. <coughs> Next question is the spinal cord stimulation efficacy declines over time. Why does it decline? This is a good question, a $64 question. Maybe some people have bright ideas like Stenson Hicks. They say, well, there could be electrode fibrosis. That's true, they love some fibrosis. Well, but the biggest base pair basket is neuroplasticity. Something changes at the cell level. And we need to know a little better explanation of what changes and how to prevent it. Because there's certainly a degradation of the beneficial effect of it. And then there is a what, what he coined, coined the, a phrase called adaptability, or they got tolerance. What is tolerance? Nobody knows. That's a good question. It's a, another thing. Why should they develop a tolerance? And you can give a holiday, you can give the amitriptyline, or whatever the hell you want to do. It doesn't make a difference. It's the random curve. Firstly, first few papers which I wrote, I said the incidence is highest in two years. And if you cost it, two years road, you're home free, but it's not home free anymore. 20 years later, it comes back. So what is the neuroplasticity? What is a, uh, or what is a tolerance? What is the mechanism? How do I reverse that? That's the question for the physiologist and the engineers. Patient reframe the pain, that's OK. Or there is aggravation of underlying pathology. This is just thrown in. We don't think it changes. No more trauma, nothing else. The, so we have to find. Fibrosis, you know, you can measure the resistance, but it's not that bad. It, it, it does rise a little bit, but not enough to, that you cannot overcome it. 
One of the biggest factors of the SCS is a palliative procedure and, and doesn't send anybody to work. That's the, as I was showing you. And, and, and we are not curing the underlying pathology. So return to work is very low. This is where, as I was telling you, the Washington state, this is a big problem. Psychological factors, you all know, everybody has got to look after that. How much is the placebo effect? 30%, 40%, how long does it last? Six months, one year? That's a good question. So we have to have a something better measurement here. Now, the paresthesia is a question which is sometimes are annoying. So do we, do we really need paresthesia to produce good effect? Is there some other way of sending the current, changing the pulse wave, changing the, the intensity, or the amount of beating it, it takes, which increase the frequency like the, like the other people have done? Uh, because uh, high frequency stimulation, you cannot feel the perception. But as I was telling you, they were telling you the road, the wrong thing. The, the last year, they said put the electrode any place, but that is no more true. You have to put the electrode in the right place. And that, is, at the moment, is known between D10 and D10, 8 and 10. That's the sweet air. So is there another place where we can put it? That's something to be found out. And it's very important. Question asked, can we do without the paresthesia in a conventional uh, spinal cord stimulation? The answer is yes and no. Some people, maybe 30% of the people, you can turn it down so low that they don't feel it and yet have a good effect. But it's not true for everything. So we have to find another way of doing it. <coughs> and this is what I was saying. The store sensor pathology, you know, because the amount of CSF which is present dictates how much current intensity needed to, to send the current to the, to the dorsal columns. So, so this adopts the voltage to the position by knowing. But the problem with this is it takes six weeks or so for the machine to learn itself. A lot of people never can get adopted to it. The another big thing, it has got event log inside it. Then it tells you how much time the patient is lying, six positions, horizontal, vertical, stretching up. It doesn't tell whether the patient is sleeping or just groaning in bed. That's no good. The patient says, I never slept, sir. There's no way you can tell it. <coughs> so we should have some, some kind of rhythmic activity in that to say he really slept. Because this, all these chronic patients say that we don't sleep. They can only say he's lying down. But he says, I'm lying down. I can't lie in one, one place. So this even lock tells you a few things as to how much is active. There's some rough dialogue of the activity. But who owns that, that statics? There's a privacy issue here. And, and that lock lasts only three months, so we should have bigger lock. There should be a way of telling the patient is asleep or not, so that we need a better kind of a, a oscillometer or whatever you want to call it. And the question, biggest question today in the world of privacy is, can the third party claim it? And I don't know. I'm scared to interrogate this thing, even doctor, because somebody will come and ask me. If I have it, they can summon it. The biggest trouble which we have got and we have failed to do and not learned from the, from the hard people is remote control, telemetry. At the moment, the spinal cord stimulation, you have to have the receiver head on the top of the battery. The Boston Scientific has a sensor which you can only tell whether the circuit is complete at, the high, at about five feet or so, but nothing. But what do I want to see is that you should be able to program by sitting in a different town. So you put a coupler on your, on your battery, and it can transmit the data to the telephone line, to the operator, who can then look at it, change it. And, and it can have a big whole Cleveland clinic. It will have the whole possibility this Ohio. They can do it from there, sitting in one room. So this is the thing. It's a very important to have a remote telemetry, which I think all the, I think this is something which one of the young boys can work, telemetry on, on that thing. Because diaphragmatic pacing can be done. Cardiac pacing is possible a little bit. So why not this? I don't know whether it's not possible, or somebody has not thought about it, or somebody has spent the money on it. OK, this is very interesting. 
This is the work which will be gone now with the third. For the Metronics one, this is the 565 or 16 contact point. But you can see, what I've identified is clinically, out of a million combination, you have got 614, which gives you a good result. The rest of it is down the garbage can. And you know, you sit around here, the plus minuses, you can see how it is, it could have, a, uh, have a, a combinations vertically, semicircularly, circularly, and all kinds of imagination. So if somebody has to do it manually, it will take three days. So this is another thing with the, uh, we need from the engineers to develop a means and means of a, 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 a integration between the computer or machine and the patient interface so that they can do their own programming or help in the programming. Otherwise, it's very time conducing. It's, it's the, but also the patient is tired and this, so is the programmer and he does, does a very sloppy job. Now, this is something to encourage you to do this thing. So what is the, you know, this, this statistics about how, many, how much you're making money and how much you know, so until two years old, nobody will tell you. Now this year, we'll be able to get it from this source. So what I wanted to show you is our spinal cord stimulation. There you are at the top. This is 1.2 billion market. We sold 60,000 units last year. And this arises 10% or more. 10 to 14% per year is going up, compounded interest is very lucrative. Total is $2.6 billion sold with 164 units. So there's a lot of money in it. All you need to do is to find a way of doing it. So you'll become rich right away. So one of the boys take this up. It's just for your encouragement I put this slide. Then the question was asked about the cost. So this is, I did it a few years ago, in 2002 published, 10 years now old. This is purely a subject of telling, calculating the cost of the, of the equipment, the spinal cord stimulator, and the conventional medical treatment over years. What interesting finding, it came out that two and a half years, the high cost of the stimulation, which was around 20,000 or 20,000 in Canada, about 30,000 here. What, it doesn't matter what figure you take, it intercepts because both sides, side, both arms rise equally in whatever country you take. Cross is two and a half years. That means in two and a half years, you are able to recollect or recover the cost, high cost of the equipment. After that, because this was done when there was single cell, it means non-rechargeable battery, in four years you have to change it. So this is the cost, and again change it. But as the more the time it lasts, the more the more the saving you are getting. So what we're trying to say that it is cost effective, and this is done with pure cost. It's nothing to do with quality of life, nothing to do with it. But it takes into consideration the cost and the and the maintenance and the and the complications. So what we do in the present day? This is the graph for present day of cost effectiveness showing the incremental nest monetary benefit versus the conventional medical treatment. What it is based is what is the society willing to pay for good one year of life, a healthy one year of life. What is the cost you're willing to pay? So this is an arbitrary figure. In the United States and Canada, formerly the Canada was 30,000, America was 50,000, but now with the rise of the Canadian dollars become 50-50. So that's the price you have to pay. The, um, the British people have also raised the price of willingness pay between 25 and 30,000 pounds per quality, per quality of life year. So what we do in this graph is to find out a calculation, which if you want, to, I've got 10 more slides of this, is produce the cost of, of the, all, the, all the cost of doing the business, this thing, like cost of the hardware, cost of implantation and complications and maintenance. Same thing you do for the, spinal, uh, for the conventional medical treatment. Then see the both sides, then you find how much EQ5 do. You convert the EQ5 do into the quality life. You have the formula there. And then see the effect of each one of this, whether you get a good quality, of, whether you get a optimum benefit or suboptimum benefit or death. The three things can happen. And you plot this all together. So what I'm just simplifying this graph. 
is that it's up to $8,000 here. This is a negative, below the zero line. That means if you're not willing to spend at least $80,000, then you are not going to get any benefit. After that, it becomes in the positive territory. Now, this I've charted four common pathologies. Common pathologies taken is the failed back surgery syndrome, Crips, peripheral arterial disease, and the refractory angina. And here is the, the last line, is the failed back surgery syndrome. Why is it down than others? Because it has got a success rate of only 47%, and plus the decay is there. So this is, but anyway, this is the most common disease. So what is telling you at $50,000 willingness to pay for one, one year of good life, you get, you're not in the positive, but you get gain $38,000 of extra benefit. So just trying to show that this is cost effective in this, as long as you're willing to pay 10,000 or more. This is in the short term what it is. There's a lot of calc statistical calculation here, but this is a true slide. Now, how, how is the cost effectiveness of the, of the you know, spinal cord stimulation versus reoperation? This is north as well. Why? This summarizes the one slide. Here's the cost of doing the job for one patient. If this patient goes for the spinal cord stimulation, it costs $48,000. If this patient falls in the wing of the reoperation, the cost is $105,000. So double the cost, you can see. Now think of this patient, he, after he has had a reoperation and failed and went back to the spinal cord, you know, uh, spinal, cord uh, spinal cord stimulation, the cost doubles, 117,000. And similarly, but what the most important part is, if you have a, uh, if you've got a reoperation, the success is zero. You know, if, if you fail the spinal cord stimulation and you do an operation, you get zero success and you spend $260,000. So this doesn't require too much maths to show that the spinal cord stimulation is a good choice financially. But the future now, to so see how we end up. One of the biggest features which we look at is the MRI compatible leads, which I talked about it and the lifespan of IPG. So I talked about the MRI, what is happening. I talked a little bit of the IPG, that we need to have the power source, and the, what are the power source which I mentioned in the last week's meeting was the microwave technology, or the ionian technology at the head of the electrode. Now, this is what Dr. Six was, Stan Hicks was just talking about where electrode needs to be improved. And this is something which the technology needs to be helped. We need, to, what, we, what is the wish list here? Wish list is that our electrode or the lead should have increased sensitivity, lower stimulation thrust, focused stimulations. Don't, you know, you, in a cylindrical lead, you get a power goes three quarters of the way outside, is wasted, one quarter to downwards. And it should have flexible, fracture resistance. So, there was a question of having a polymer coating and to answer the call, but this is just one of the solutions. We need something, a better, better electrode, which is very flexible, factor resistance, and less power you require. So we are taking it now, we, we know what conventional, what, what, is, what are the theories are coming on the way. And they, one of the best things which is now being touted is the dorsal column, is the dorsal root ganglion, which is present in, in any nerve, in foramen of uh, inter, intervertebral foramen. And this has got the specificity, and you find all the problems or changes taking place in, the, in this region. You can see it has got the specificity. So you can, if you can put an electrode in that hole, you, you can, like this, you require a special equipment. You can see this is the four contacts are gone inside the um, dorsal root ganglion. The, there is a very little CSF, therefore. Therefore, the amount of current required is one-tenth of what the normally does. And but the specific, you can stimulate the toe or foot or heel or something. So no wastage of current and good specificity. In the, this has not been 
started in the United States. It's been, it has been approved in, in Europe. They're ahead of us all the time. Oh. This is showing the specificity in the, in the histological sections. Nevros, as you well heard, what I wanted to show you that although they're saying the back pain is improved, but here if you look at this, the leg pain has a slightly edge over the back pain. This is their own slides, up to kilohertz. And as I was trying, one of the things is to where, what is the waveforms they're not telling, and how does it work? and where you have to specifically put the lead. Then we take uh, to the other thing, which is now a burning topic, is the tripole lead with the Alzheimer's uh, graphic modeling, which has got negative pole in the middle and the positive, so that instead of current spreading sidewards and uh, is trimating the radicular arteries or um, nerve roots or intercostal nerve roots, it can, the current could affectionately pull towards the midline and then go in the dorsal column. This is an extremely good model as far as the computer modeling is concerned. But in practice, it's not as good, although there's some theory behind it, and rightly so. But it doesn't answer all the questions. We have still got problems. We cannot get the hire back. So this is something which we have become a better way of modeling for the engineers. Then we have a higher success. Remote programming, I've already talked about it. And then, is it, then we are entering into an area, what we call a field stimulation or subcutaneous stimulation. This field is mushrooming. And what we question is, where do we put the electrodes? If you put it too far down over the deep fascia or then you get a muscle contraction. If you've got too superficial, you get a skin irritation. So the formula has to be devised. Well, there's one paper out scientifically. Where exactly is the electrode to be placed in the subcutaneous tissue? This requires much more work. And I think this is for the engineers to work on it. Because this field is here to grow. It's mushrooming like hell. This. So where, what we have to look less, can we afford the a good question is, which was put to me, can we afford the treatment in 2020? What will it be? We can only afford it two ways. If we can improve the sensitivity to this, if we afford the, if we afford the longevity of the success rate, then we will be able to afford. Otherwise, we will be go bankrupt. What are the new indications? We are looking at visceral and abdominal pain and gastric mobility, sexual dysfunction spinal degenerative disease like spinal stenosis. It works a little bit, but it's a palliative thing. And neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson's. There's some papers out on that. So that's a good thing if you can cure the Parkinson's or the Alzheimer's or something like that. The another thing which is, is the, which we have a big problem is the neurovegetative state like the head injury or thing. By increasing, this is true, that you can improve the cerebral circulation by putting the spinal electrodes in the cervical region. The Japanese have done a lot of work. But can we improve the end point of it? And they are saying, yes, you can't. I suppose this, there is some merit in it and requires more work. The, one of the biggest things which I find, which has come out in the heart, is, is in, the, in the congestive heart disease. The heart function can be restored by balancing the sympathetic and parasympathetic output. This is down in the RCT stage since last two years and showing promise. So something like that, if we could do, you know, will be a big success story. As I, I'm just going to talk to you about the field stimulation. It works if you put along the nerve, like a genital femoral intercostal, <coughs> or a herpetic neuralgia. If you put the elect subcutaneous electrode along, it works. Atypical facial pain is another one which is gaining ground, but no RCT so far. And I think the facial pain is still remains, uh, still not everybody is not responding, although a little better than what we have. If this is, we're not talking trigeminal, we're atypical facial pain. 
and this is a field which needs to be worked on. Migraine have a sub answer to that by putting occipital leads. And here is the another last slide of the day for you to munch on how to improve the my aching back here. What can I do? Well, what kind of company? This is spinal cord lead inside epidurally. Then you put the leads outside in the skin. How to combine the various combinations to get harness the back pain? That's for you to find out. So thank you very much. I hope I like. That's it from some talk. All right. I think we have about ten careers worth of. Uh, research topics here, so that's fantastic. Uh, we have time for a couple questions coming. Yes, sir. Um, you have obviously a very vast experience in this area, and I, I was wondering if you learned something beyond the gate theory to explain some of the mechanisms involved. I think gate theory, gate theory was a good kick start, to, because that, at that time when gate theory came up, we, were, we had no explanation as to how, how the system works. Gate theory was a partial explanation. At least it was silent, some critics, but it doesn't explain everything. We have much more to it. The gate theory was just the start, isn't it? Stan, what do you think? Well, I think the neural matrix is probably where a lot of the money lies. Uh, because it, it, from the MRI studies that have been, and the done, <coughs> It's easy to see that uh, when neuromodulation at whichever site changes the, uh, the uh, normalizes the capture effect, I think that may be uh, one one aspect that explains a lot of the problems that we uh, we face with neurostimulation, the so-called tolerance, uh, where I think there is an adaptation in the, in the central nervous system uh, that uh, prevents the uh, therapeutic effects. Uh, from, but uh, there are a lot of benefits for peripheral nerve stimulation. Um, Antigravic orthogravic collision is a, is a good way of explaining, and that it has been shown in animal studies, and now most recently in a, in a, in a human uh, study. But, but uh, I think, as you said, I think gate theory is just really a, uh, it's it's just a, a way it's of trying to the door, get the, the foot in the doorway. But the whole world is still to go. Alright, one last question. Um, this goes back to your intersection between the success and failure graph. Um, you said to move to the left, you want more cooperation from your clinical colleagues to be able to enroll people sooner. Much faster, yes. So would they be more cooperative if you were to adapt your clinical trials where the enrollment is really not guided by you or them? But it's really guided by the success rate that is falling into each group. For instance, if somebody is advocated for reoperation, um, those individuals could fall into one group depending on their success rate or the success rate of the group or the people who came in before that. That way, perhaps the clinical colleagues might not be so resistant to letting people be enrolled in one group versus another that might take care of the reverse placebo that people might get from SCS. What I showed you, this has been published fragmented. This is in three different papers, you know. I might have put it all together in one paper, and that's why I was trying to get the help of the American colleagues is to see if we can somehow else can collaborate this data, then it will have much more forceful. At the moment, uh, you know, the single centers have not been able to prove it because they don't have enough number of patients. And one of the biggest problems which you find, not with Cleveland Clinic, but in the general public, their programming is done by the by the people who belongs to the industry. They come with you. They come with you for the implant, and they program it. You don't have any. And when he retires or goes away to get transferred, he takes the data with him. You have nothing. So this is the biggest difference. So <coughs> this this requires 25 years of data to be collected, and at least a thousand people to do this graph. And I can't find anybody who has got that kind of data. So. So I have to have some collaborators to who should agree with me. The only thing I could get to say was that it looks that way, but they don't say it looks exactly this way. So that's the we can use that yet. But that's truth. All right. Well, let's thank Dr. Kumar again.